Week three, Vikes now. I am Dustin Baker. I'm here with Josh Fry. We are navigating an 0-2 start for these Minnesota Vikings. And lo and behold, we have a desperation game afoot for both teams at U.S. Bank Stadium on Sunday. The 0-2 Chargers, the 0-2 Vikings, two teams accustomed to roller coaster, wacky games, crazy finishes. Two teams that like to score points that are like with defense, like, you know what, we'll figure that out when we get there. So I got Josh Fry on today, our weekly uh, Wednesday guest. First, before we get into storylines that you're going to chat about, do you have confidence that the Vikings will turn this season around uh, and be honest with me, or do you think it really is going to be like eight and nine at best? I I think I have more confidence coming out of week two than I did coming out of week one, just because, I mean, Philadelphia, that's supposed to be a top team in the NFC, and despite turning the ball over four times, losing the <laughs> turnover game by three again, you you still came within a touchdown of winning that game, did if one of those if one of those turnovers just doesn't happen, you probably win that game. Like the JJ fumble on the goal line, the mm. Brandon Powell punt return. If one of those things just bounces the right way, I think the Vikings probably win that game. So I, I feel pretty good. I think they're going to win this week. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> and then you go into Carolina. I don't feel as good about that team as I did coming into the year. And I think we're looking at a two and two two and two record going into that Chiefs game, which is about as good as you probably could have hoped for uh, coming into that one. You know, what's so weird about the Eagles game. I, I haven't even wrote about this or talked about this on air is even despite those follies, the four turnovers, you know, what was weird is when they got to 34, 28 and, you know, they, they could have got a stop and then tried to go down and win. It was such a close game. The Vikings could have won by one, but it never really felt like they were going to do that. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's like last year we expected it no matter who they were playing like, oh, sweet. They're going to get the ball back. Even Donatel's good fourth quarter defense for some reason. We we're like, all right, well, here we come. But when it was 34, 28, I think they had to get a three and out or something close to it. They didn't even bother doing it. But at that point in the game, I was like, yeah, they're only down six. They're not going to win. But this is exciting. It was weird how that transpired, how far we've 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 come in these these two weeks to say like, oh, well, they're not going to pull this one off. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't understand why Kevin O'Connell called that timeout down on the goal line with the Eagles. They were on the verge of scoring again, and I feel like you, if you just let them score there, then you save that timeout. Mm -hmm. I think they have a little bit of a better chance of winning that game down down the stretch. I'm not an NFL head coach, so maybe I'm just an idiot. Um, but that's just that's just what that's how I that's what I came away from this game. Uh, thinking just a few coaching mistakes, too many turnovers again. They get those two things fixed up. I think this is a pretty solid team. Yeah, and it notably, and you, you don't know quite as much about this as the rest of the group, but there are a lot of Vikings games from short, recent history and beyond where everything goes wrong, like the Packer yeah. game at Green Bay and miss extra points if they they fumble a lot, like just like the Packer game in Week 17 last year. And as soon as Brandon Powell fumbled that punt, I'm like, oh, God. And then Madison exactly. fumbled. <laughs> yep. And I thought at that point, I would have predicted, all right, this is going to be like 40 to seven or some shit. But they did their best to make it a reasonable uh, event. And then with your with your point on Jefferson, yeah, it, it's so strange that that completely changed everything. Your 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 Michael Jordan on the football team uh, messed it up and, you know, he was largely forgiven because he's Justin Jefferson. But like the Irv Smith drop last year, these Eagles games on the road, there's always a moment of truth. And these last two years have been bungled. So I wish they would change that damn rule. And like the fair penalty for Justin fumbling outside or out of the end zone should be that the same team keeps the ball, but they got to go back 20 yards. I think that would be more than fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I I kind of understand it if it's, like, fumbled out of the back of the end zone. Like, at that point, it's like, okay, yeah, you probably screwed something up pretty bad there. But if it's on the sideline like that, yeah, I think giving the other team the ball, first of all, and then ruling it a touchback so they get 20 yards extra <laughs> on top of that. I don't know. I feel like I feel like that's something that needs to be visited at some point. And with the uproar following that game, it feels like that might be something that they address this upcoming offseason. Yeah, well, what what you want to happen for change is you want some shit to happen to the Chiefs. You want a right. bad thing to happen to the Chiefs in that, that that happens to them in a big AFC championship, and then they'll change it. If it's just the old Vikings week two, nobody cares. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, storylines. I've already put out the big one. Even if you mimic it, that's just fine. Desperation from both teams. Uh, the Chargers came into this season with a 9.5 win uh, over under. 
They could probably still get it, but they're probably not going to get it if they hit 0-3. This is an explosive football team coming to Minneapolis, so I want to know five storylines that you're monitoring, and thus our viewers should go. Yeah, I mean, like I said, desperation beats desperation. Classic loser leaves town match in Minneapolis this weekend. <laughs> um, but big thing, first and foremost, that I'm monitoring going into this one is the Chargers injuries, because they've got a lot of them right now. They had, I think, four or five players miss the game last week against the Titans. Two of them were Austin Eckler and Eric Kendricks, two players that on both sides of the ball probably are going to make a pretty big impact when they're healthy. But especially with Eckler probably being out in week three, I know uh, Brandon Staley said something along the lines of there's no timetable for his return, um, which makes me think that he's probably going to sit out. And if he sits out, that means Joshua Kelly is getting the RB1 reps again this weekend. Last week, he did pretty well. It was 19 carries, 94 yards and a touchdown, something along those lines. Um, And it, it was it was a decent showing, especially against the Mike Vrabel defense. With this Minnesota Vikings run defense, I think they 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 desperately need to stop the ball uh, because the Philadelphia Eagles, if they did one thing last Thursday that really exposed this defense, it was run the juice right out of the clock, for especially that 15 play touchdown drive where they ran the ball like 13 times. And it was it wasn't even like chunk yards. It was just five, eight. And it was just methodically moving the ball down the field and the Vikings need to be able to stop that this weekend. Brian Flores must have been paranoid that A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith were destined to beat him for 50-yard touchdowns because notably on those drives, they just they, they had like uh, Harrison Phillips up front, and that was about it. And it was like, yeah. all right, we'll just have a bunch of defensive backs and off-ball linebackers stop the run. And that's not how it works. It can't work that way. I don't even know if you can get rid of uh, – get away with that against a shitty team that rushes the ball. Uh, so it's no one. And I, I don't, I don't understand the strategy. Hopefully he learns from it. Um, but it was, I mean, it was like a, a Donatel scenario. Like, I don't know going to keep going. And then maybe once they get to the red zone, they'll, they'll stiffen, which didn't really happen. Um, so yeah, Joshua Kelly, I think uh, fantasy football managers know all about Austin Eckler's situation. Uh, he was a, most mostly a first round pick in most fantasy drafts. So we shall see if he plays Sunday uh, other than injuries. What's your next one? Uh, next one. I think this Vikings pass rush overall needs to get a lot better heading into week three. Uh, yeah. The chargers in terms of PFF rank among the top 10 in terms of their pass blocking grades. They've got a terrific offensive line with Deshaun Slater over at the left tackle spot, Corey Lindsley, that acquisition they stole from the Packers a few years back. has definitely seemed to work out for them. Um, so in terms of, just the pass rush. Daniil Hunter has been fantastic. Four sacks, five tackles for loss, leads the NFL in both departments. Really glad that the Vikings were managed to keep him around this uh, offseason. Um, but outside of him, Patrick Jones, DJ Wanham, we need to see something out of these guys. Marcus Davenport, if he gets on the field this week for more than four or five plays, whatever it was last <laughs> weekend. Um, and, and then just the interior. Dee Lowry was a guy that seemed like they brought him in because of his pass rushing ability. He managed to do, he had five sacks in the 2021 season for the Packers. And this year, zero pressures for the first two weeks. And my, maybe part of that is just Brian Flores not playing him enough. But at the end of the day, this guy needs to be able to generate some sort of pass rush from the interior of the defensive line. Cause that was one of the big weaknesses for the Vikings last year. And so far it's been the Neil Hunter or bust it, or Ivan Pace too. But I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of true pass rushers, it's the Neil Hunter or nothing for the Vikings at this point. And that needs to get a lot better this week. Yeah. And that's the run defense was suspect last year with Dalvin Tomlinson, who right. doesn't work here anymore. And then on top of not even really playing any of your big bodied players at certain parts of the game, when you know, they're going to run the ball is problematic. I think, I think you've heard uh, Vikings fans call for Akeem Hicks, uh, because if they show that they're willing to sign Dalton Reisner, why not having a why not have a bonanza uh, of spending? Um, and I think that comes from the tandem of having Dean Lowry and sometimes Jonathan Bullard up front. It's kind of a, a nothing burger of, I mean, at least big name talent. I mean, God love Dean Lowry. Uh, his PFF score doesn't love him. It's down nope. to like 30, <laughs> 35 or something wretched like that. He'll probably have a spree of a couple good games because usually he's pretty darn consistent, consistently decent. Um, I should say. All right, number three storyline with what? Four days to go before Vikings Chargers. Number three, the Vikings need to attack this Chargers secondary. They've been the absolute worst pass defense in the entire NFL so far this season. They have the most passing yards allowed, the most net yards per attempt at nine, which is 
just ridiculous if you're allowing a first down every single time somebody drops back to pass the ball. Uh, so between Justin Jefferson, KJ Osborne, and Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson too, I think these four guys are in line for a pretty big game against this Chargers secondary. And with how the Vikings run running offense has been with <laughs> Alexander Madison just – not being able to get anywhere on the ground. Some of that probably has to do with the offensive line's ability. Um, and hopefully Dalton Reisner is a guy that can help improve that. But this passing offense, they're going to rely on them again this weekend. And the Chargers secondary, I, the, this is an opportunity for Justin Jefferson to go off for his 200-yard game, three touchdowns, something crazy like that. And hopefully K.J. Osborne can get off this night as well because the last two weeks haven't been great for him. It's bittersweet that we have a contest where the Chargers feature a relatively weak secondary because we need to get we need to start running the ball a little bit. True. <laughs> uh, I think the Vikings have thrown it 79% of the time, which is just like, you wouldn't do that that much in Madden. Um, nope. that, that's the weird part of this. And I understand that the two the two first two games have been unique and you couldn't get the run game going and then playing from behind a little bit against the Eagles. But there is no sustainability whatsoever. I don't care how pass happy this this game has got in the last half decade. Uh, you cannot just not run the football. And you don't have to establish the run. You don't have to bring Mike Zimmer's idea, ideas back. But you've got to keep the defense, your defense, off the field. Uh, you have to manage the time of possession. And then you have to keep the other team guessing what you're going to do. If they know that you're just going to throw it every time, that's fine. The Vikings can probably still find a way to a mediocre record if all they do is throw. But if you want to be a serious team that wants to contend for the postseason, like you said, maybe this Dalton Reisner thing will be the catalyst. But it, it is disgusting how little the Vikings have even thought about running the ball. When we see all this chatter about, oh, let's go get Kareem Hunt before he Browns get him. Let's go get Leonard Fournette because Alexander, Alexander Madison sucks. We don't even know if Madison sucks sucks because he's not playing. They're not giving him the ball. Um, yeah, and he had he had a regrettable, uh, what was it, fumble and then almost a second fumble that was negated. So I would, I would give the Vikings rushing offense a chance, assuming that they will say like, yeah, let's run the ball a little bit. Cause you're not going to play the interior defensive lines of the bucks and the Eagles every week. And it should start to soften up. Am I wrong? No, I think that that's exactly right. And I mean, to put into terms exactly how bad the Vikings rushing offense has been Taysom Hill, a tight end has 10 <laughs> more yards on the ground than the entire Vikings offense does this season. It, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, Taysom Hill, the, He's, he's the gadget weapon for the Saints, but if he's the guy that's putting up 10 more yards on your entire offense, it's not going very well. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've i written, I've mentioned this in a couple of Vikings territory articles. The Vikings have run the football 26 times and in all of NFL history, going back to like 1922, that is the third least through two games of any team ever. The normal football team, the average, I think it's the Jacksonville Jaguars, they've run it 54 times in two games. So 27 times each week, and the Vikings are running at 13. Uh, so yeah, I, I and, and this is all after an offseason. Eight months, pal. Me and you listen to them. Everybody on the team, commitment to the run. Alexander Madison, we're going to run it more. Josh Oliver said it. Kevin O'Connell, we need to get the run game going. We're like, all right, we're, we're doing the thing. And then they've done the opposite. Like they've, they've run it less. <laughs> And, and the crazy thing is they, they put out personnel that makes it seem like they're going to run the ball a lot more. Like Josh Oliver is getting a ton of playing time. CJ Ham is probably through two weeks, like at his career high in terms of snaps with the offense. I think he had like 14 again uh, in week two and 22 in week one. So these guys are getting on the field. They're just, they, they, they refuse to run the ball. And when they do, it just hasn't worked. So hopefully that's something too, that just, gets a little bit better over the next few weeks i think especially that carolina game is when we'll that'll be the true test of gee how bad is this is this yeah. uh is this rushing offense actually because the panthers haven't been able to stop anybody on the ground for the first two weeks i wonder if there's any evidence to suggest it's a kirk thing because if they're putting the personnel out there is he checking into a pass uh, I mean, that that sounds conspiratorial, but it it just doesn't make sense that they're not even trying to run the, unless they just see Vitavea and Jalen Carter are like, nope, no, we're not even gonna, we're not even gonna bother. We yeah. know it's gonna be, <laughs> no, it's gonna be one yard per carry, so we're not doing it. All right, so I don't even remember what, what was your original point there. Was that uh, <laughs> was that, that was that was just the Vikings need to attack the second. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. We, we went on a tangent from they need to throw the ball to they need to run the ball. That's hilarious. Yeah. All right, what is number four before we get to your final one? 
Uh, just what exactly does this Vikings offensive line look like going oh, into yeah. this game? Because Christian Darisaw, who knows what's going on with his ankle, he sat out week two. And he tried to warm up for the game, it sounded like, but he just wasn't able to go. And if he isn't able to go, Aliudo's not there anymore. He's out for the year. And if it ends up being Darisaw can't play, it's probably David Questenberry in that spot, which will be very interesting to see how he holds up against a guy like Khalil Mack <laughs> on the on the <laughs> other side of the ball. Um, but then on the interior, is Ed Ingram going to be able to play again or are they going right into this Dalton Reisner thing? It seems like with the $2.25 million guaranteed that they gave him that they're probably just going to try to throw him in there and see what happens. Um, but yeah, Ed, is it he goes to right guard? Does he go to left guard? And Ezra Cleveland goes over to right guard. Who plays at center? Because Austin Schlotman hasn't been very good either. And Garrett Bradbury doesn't seem like he's going to be back anytime soon. So just what in the world does this offensive line look like when they roll out on Sunday? So I know football pretty well. I've been watching it for over 30 years, but I don't know enough to give an opinion whether or not an offensive guard six days in the building, if that is enough time for the guy to be ready. Exactly. I I I don't know know because he has that connection to Chris Cooper. So in theory, I guess the interworkings of the offensive line from his Denver days should be similar. But I can't, I, I, I've, I've tried to figure out, all right, is this guy, was he going to play right away? Or is this going to be one of the things where we groan when Ed Ingram mess, me, makes a mistake and we got to wait? Uh, we, it would probably make more sense that Reisner would get going against Carolina. Uh, but then again, it's, I, I, it's not, I, I don't think he quite has to learn the playbook like a quarterback, you know, right. because let's face it, he's just wrestling up and up front the, the, for, <laughs> for 60 minutes or three hours of real time. So yeah, I, I, especially since you set the stage with Derisaw. Now, Derisaw has had 10 days of rest. Let's hope he's good to go because otherwise, yeah, you'd be you'd have uh, Quaisenberry. Uh, he'd be on the left side. Then you had Cleveland, Schlotman, probably Ingram, and then uh, the knight in shining armor, O'Neal. Um, and you're like, right, is that gonna can can Joey yeah. Bosa circumvent that? Probably, right? <laughs> and I mean, the other sneaky thing is what they consider kicking Ezra Cleveland out to that left tackle spot too, mm-hmm. because he played it throughout his entire career at Boise state and he did pretty damn well at it. So I think that might be something in the back of their mind. I don't know if that's a week three thing or if it'd be more like, Oh, week 10, this thing's still not working out. And Derisaw is still on the shelf with that ankle. Hopefully that's not the case. Cause that would be terrible. Um, absolute worst case scenario, but mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting to see how they line up on Sunday. <laughs> And if it's any consolation, um, it, it it's weird that Kirk Cousins is still cooking with an offensive line, at least to the naked eye, that looks like it's problematic. I often get embroiled in an internal debate, um, especially these last two games, because you see Ben, ben Baldwin's stat about the Vikings' pass protection is eighth best in the NFL, even after week two. So I often, my internal debate is, every time we see a pressure or Kirk knockdown, are we like, oh, are we too critical and thinking like just because we saw two in a 15 minute span that the offensive line therefore sucks because the metrics are saying from PFF to ESPN to whatever one, the other one Ben Baldwin uses is that the off the pass protection isn't that bad. What say you? Yeah, I think that's a lot of credit to Cleveland. Honestly, he's been mm-hmm. one of the best passing blockers in the entire NFL at, at the guard spot. And that's been a huge improvement over the past few years for him. And this year, I think he's still grading up in the eighties in terms of his pass yeah. protection, which is, just an incredible development, especially this point of the season with Derisaw out. I think that has a lot to do with it. Brian O'Neill just being that steady player that he always has been at that right tackle spot. That I think at the end of the day, I, a lot of our frustration with the run uh, blocking has kind of trans transformed itself into the pass protection as well. Because honestly, the pass protection hasn't been horrible, especially considering that Eagles defense. Like I thought mm-hmm. they were going to have Kirk on the ground all the time. I think they only sacked him twice or maybe three times in that game um so yeah i i don't think it's been horrible to say the least uh but it, it definitely could get a little bit better too <laughs> yeah yeah we always know that um it's just in the grand scheme uh of a season ben baldwin's metric uh i think i've tweeted a couple times if the viewers want to go look at it on my twitter feed he's not making shit up and so yeah. the pass protection probably isn't as bad as we think and i truly think at times that we'll see 
one sack and Cousins fumbles against Tampa. And we're like, oh, it's same shit. They didn't improve anything. And it's like, well, you know, that was a single play. And, you know, if he gets knocked down again, that happens in the NFL. Uh, so I, I've tried to now. Now, if, if Ben Baldwin's stats said they're ranked 27th, I'd be like, oh, OK, suspicions confirmed. But consistently now for two weeks, the Vikings have been in the top 10 of that son of a bitch. And I'm like, huh, uh, maybe maybe there's more that meets the eye. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right there. And I think it translates to the fact that Cousins is second in the league in <laughs> passing yards, first in touchdowns, and only one interception through the first two weeks. I, the pass protection has held up to their credit. Um, so I, it, 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 ha- it hasn't been bad. Yeah, we'll just, put, yeah. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> I'm excited to see, especially if the Vikings win Sunday, I'm excited to see the rest of season Kirk, the progression, because you know yeah. – and the viewers know that he gets hot in October and November. That's why we call it Kirk Kirktober and Kirk Vember. I think we started calling it Kirk Vember, but in truth, statistically, it's it's Kirktober. It's Kirktober. Yep, yeah. Uh, October. <laughs> yeah, he's a fiend in a good way. Uh, and so if he starts off this way, I'm very curious, especially if the Vikings win Sunday and then win at Carolina, get two and two. If he's going to have a career season, kind of like we thought could happen with the second year of O'Connell, or if it flips, he gets October, November, and then we get kind of like, oh, Mm, that isn't what we were looking for. All yeah, right, man. I'm, he's, yeah, go uh, ahead. he's he's on pace to throw for over 6,000 <laughs> passing yards right now. So it's, it's off to a pretty good start. And then JJ opposite him on pace for like 3,000 receiving yards. But the, the goal was 2,000. He's on pace for 3,000. Yeah, so I, I'll take that any day. <laughs> what do you got for your final storyline, Vikings Chargers, Sunday at noon? I mean, at the end of the day – just stop the silly turnovers. Mm. Stop making me pull my hair out. <laughs> I guess the, the, it, it, it's already going away on its own. So <laughs> yeah, I already pulled I, mine out. I, yeah. Right. Mm. I, I uh, just seven turnovers through two weeks. It leads the league. And if you just have one or two of those things that don't happen and you're like second in turnovers rather than first, mm-hmm. you're probably two and zero at this point. So just stop the silly turnovers. Kirk, don't take the silly strip sacks. Get the ball out on time. Alexander Madison, stop flumming the ball. And JJ, just maybe go out of bounds instead of trying to reach for the goal line on that on that <laughs> on that on that catch. <laughs> but yeah, just no silly turnovers this weekend, and I think we're good. To my uh, to my naked eye, watching both games, I got up off well, got up out of my seat at US Bank Stadium, and then off my couch on Thursday night, thinking. They seem like they're a fixed fumble problem away from being good. And then I do what I always do. I ask myself, all right, is that because I love this team so much? Am I having a homer take that they're probably just diseased and the fumbles are a symptom? Uh, but I keep coming back to it when I look at the metrics, whether it's the uh, DVOA, which suddenly paints the Vikings in a positive light, or EPA per play. It really does seem by the numbers and by the eye test that if they get back to a normal amount of fumbles or a good amount of fumbles – uh, meaning that they're not fumbling it all the time, that they're probably a team that can win the division. And it, it sounds ludicrous when they're 0-2 and got the Chargers on the horizon. Um, but I think we're going to get an almighty verdict uh, on Sunday to figure out, A, if they can hold on to the ball and don't just swap fumbles for interceptions or something stupid. And then it, it's a good test because the Chargers ain't bitches. I mean, they're going to – they they need to win too. Everything we've said about the Vikings heading to 0-3 and, and the numbers about two and a half percent of teams make the postseason after starting 0 three they all apply to the chargers as well and brandon staley's on a hot seat kevin o'connell is not with that said you want to give me a prediction and we'll get off air i'm going to go 31 21 vikings this weekend i think that they move the ball very well through the air and daniel hunter gets a couple sacks they put a little pressure on justin herbert and i, I think they pull away down this down the stretch of this one we're really, really, really due for a relaxing Vikings win. I don't think it's this one. Not Chargers, no, Vikings. No, yeah, I know, yeah. And I got to stop predict. I think I've predicted, like, not the playoff game, but I think the last four home games, I've predicted the Vikings winning by at least two touchdowns because it's due to happen. Like you said, it probably won't happen but the, against the Chargers. But I swear, outside of that Bears game in Week 18, which was quasi-meaningless except for the Bears getting the – first overall pick at home or anywhere. The Vikings are due to win a game in the old fashioned way. When Mike Zimmer was coach where they win by 14 points. And if it ends up that score, that just meant that the other team evened it up. I mean, we haven't had a 
a normal win. It feels like in forever, I guess probably against the Packers in week one last year when. Just- yeah, that's probably, that's definitely the closest <laughs> one because every single other one has been one possession. So, and the yeah. hilarious part about that one is that we, everybody expected the Packers to come roaring back at the time. Yep. We didn't know that they were going to be mediocre for the rest of the season, but that one didn't feel all like just put on cruise control uh, because Rogers was still, we thought at the time, MVP Rogers. All right, man. Uh, you got, uh, what was it? Say it again. What was the score prediction? 31, 21, 31, 21. All right. I like it. All right, man. Uh, when we, when we chat next Wednesday, it'll either be doom and gloom and uh, we might even start talking about, uh, the draft if they get to own and three if, if they lose that if they lose this weekend i'm all aboard the caleb hype uh, <laughs> caleb williams hype train man <laughs> just go zero and 17 go get your quarterback and start everything over <laughs> yeah all right we'll talk to you in one week my man sounds good see you later, later.